Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. This is uh, 23rd of April to 10 p.m. and we are at PyCon Germany and PyData Berlin 2024. Uh, the title for my talk is like Exploring Czar from Fundamentals to V3 and Beyond. I'm not gonna lie, this is the title that was suggested to me by ChatGPT. So yeah, I'm right, I, wrote, I wrote the proposal myself and I thought nah, I couldn't figure out a title so I was like just give it to ChatGPT and see what it says. So I was like okay, let's go with this. And yeah, I take yes on the section where you have to say that if you use ChatGPT. So yeah, I didn't lie. Um, so yeah, my name is Sanket Arma and I take care of the community and the open source software of Zar as their community manager. I've been in this position for s more than two years now, yeah. And uh, if you like this talk, yeah, I mean, please check me out on Twitter. There's a QR code for that. Um, the slides are basically uh, on this uh, QR code and you can also go to this uh, short link if you wanna follow along. I'm just gonna wait for like 10 seconds before I uh, move ahead. <clears throat> Everyone got it? Yeah, all right. And I also uploaded the slides and the notebook to my GitHub repository, so if you wanna check out the notebook and stuff, you can also use this. But there's gonna be another link for the notebook at the demo session, so yeah. Okay, moving on. So we'll be mostly talking about like uh, going from like fundamentals basically, like what is Zar, and which will cover like basics using illustrations, like neat graphics, then we're gonna go towards like what's new in the Zar spec V3. And then I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the community, like how does we form the community, how do we accept proposals, and how do we actually work on the specification. And we actually have a, like a nice process which is known as SEPS, which is kind of similar to like PEPS. And is, it is, yeah, you guessed it right, it, it is known as ZAR Enhancement Proposals. And there's gonna be like a small demo uh, of like how the things work, are working in like ZAR V3. Um, so yeah, coming to the, uh, starting with the basics. Um, so basically arrays are the, you know, container, container of items with same data type and size. And the number of the dimensions and the items are basically described by the shape. So you, here we have like a 1D array, which is like, uh, which has a shape of like seven. Then you have 2D, which is seven into seven. And then we have like a 3D, which is like seven into seven into two. So this is how you basically organize your arrays into like uh, container items. And it's necessary to have like the same data type across all the items. And so basically, yeah, this illustration was, was made by this person, Trevor Mann, so yeah, huge shout out to him. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, let's just say if you have a data set that you want to work with and it's uh, small enough to basically load into your memory, store into your memory, make changes to it, it's fine, like, right? Like just say you have 100 megabytes of data set, you can easily work with it. But what if the data gets like too big and it's 1,000 gigabytes or something like that? You won't be able to like load it, store it, or make changes to it. And that's where basically ZAR kicks in. And what ZAR, is, what ZAR actually does, it, it basically divides the big array into like small equal parts. And this process is known as chunking, as you can see. And we, the small equal parts are known as basically chunks. And we compress those, each individual chunks, and we have like uh, compressors, which are like state-of-the-art compressors from various uh, organizations. And actually there's a library known as NumCodex, which is a dependency of ZAR, which is also hosted under the ZAR developer GitHub organization, and which basically helps to compress all these small chunks into it. And when your array is like compressed and divided into small parts, it, it's basically a ZAR array. And the retrieval basically works in a way that, so let's just say if you want to select the chunks which are borderline with orange selection area. So the ZAR will only load the chunks which are in this area, the violet one, not the entire array. So let's just say if you are have like a thousand gigabytes of array and you want to load only the, I don't know, a few megabytes of that. And, you, and ZAR will only load that array and you can store it, load it, make changes to it and then save it back to it. Which basically saves a lot of space and a lot of uh, headaches when you're working with like small system, big system, big data sets. Um, the assignment of the uh, keys and the values basically works similar to Python dictionaries. So the value here is are basically the keys. Uh, the keys are basically the values which are assigned, like, assigned as 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 1.0, and the value are basically the actual data encoded in binary format. So this is basically how stuff works in ZAR Python. So in Python you have this mutable mapping function set item and get item, which basically um, over here you can see like the point zero zero. This is the first chunk in the array is assigned this 
bind encoded value. And when you want to retrieve this, uh, this particular chunk, the get atom functions call for it and it basically gives it, you input the key and you get the value. It decompresses the chunk and you get the actual value. And you wanna make some changes to it, you store it back, the compress the chunk, then the, then the binary, the, the binary uh, value of the chunk is changed because you changed it and it's stored back into the main array. So this is essentially the uh, basic working of how the uh, chunking and the mapping works in the Zar Python ecosystem. Uh, you can organize multiple arrays into uh, hierarchies which are known as groups. So this uh, green uh, column is known as basically, this green block is known as the metadata which contains the actual information about the Zar array, which includes the data type, the chunk shape, the size of the array, any special attributes you wanna add or stuff. So this was basically, sorry, so this was basically the version two, like how things are looking in version two. But there's actually a neat graphic which shows how we evolved from version two to version three. So yeah, coming back to the uh, specification. So basically specification, ZAR is actually based on a specification which is a technical document which lays out how your metadata should look like, what does, what's your chunking strategy, how your, how your hierarchies are basically organized, what are the attributes, and what type of data types do you have. And it's basically a technical document, I mean, anyone can read it, it's over here if you wanna have a look. And it contains like version two, version, version one, two, and three. And this is, this is essentially uh, based on which the ZAR software is written. And it has implementation in like all the languages. So, I mean, it's like it's evident enough that the Python community is big and large. So the ZAR Python library has the most number of users, but we also have like implementation in C++, C, Rust, Julia, JavaScript, Java. And I mean, implementations are basically growing day by day. So there are, I think there are, I think if there are, I think there are three Rust implementations as of today, two Java implementations, uh, one Julia, and I think three JavaScript implementations. So yeah, the community is growing like really fast. Um, so basically the thing is like the version two was working really well for us and uh, things were going good. But like the question comes back like why did we start working on the V3? I think the first commit goes back to 2018 or 19 if I'm right. Yeah, when the work started for the V3 specification. And there are like multiple reasons like why we started working on the V3 specification. So the first thing was the interoperability. So V2 was version two specification was originally designed uh, with the ZAR Python implementation. So it basically relies heavily on the NumPy machinery and fundamentals. And which basically the, the, all the other programming languages kind of feel like left out. So what we did is like we uh, slimmed down the core specification and make it more language agnostic so that any language can implement it. Then there was the uh, latency, high latency storage. So the V2, was, V2 specification was uh, developed keeping in mind the local file storage. But there are certain operations which have like high latency when you're dealing with cloud object, cloud object storage like Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Service or Azure. And so basically this, uh, this was basically removed, this high latency storage operation, uh, the high latency uh, for the per operation time was reduced by consolidating the metadata into a single document. I mean, earlier we saw that there was like multiple uh, JSON documents and Right now, they are basically consolidated, consolidated into a single document. Um, and the last part is like, which is the really exciting one is the extent, extensibility. So over the years, ZAR has like gained a lot of traction in the various domains like genomics, uh, geospatial, data science, uh, bioimaging, and nuclear. So people in this, these domains are using ZAR heavily for their storage needs. And all these domains have various feature requests or various needs that they want to add to the ZAR. And V2 specification didn't have any mechanism to add this feature into the specification. So that's why we started working on this new concept which is known as extension mechanism which allows you to add new feature to the ZAR without touching the core specification. And this is like one of the most exciting stuff, exciting part of the V3 specification. Um, so yeah, uh, let's look over at this, some of the major design updates that uh, we made. So we restructured the whole JSON metadata. So JSON, JSON metadata that was in V2 is like completely different from what it looks in V3. And so this is what the V2 looks like. So this is a simple ZAR array which chunks ordered in a manner and you have the Z array which contains all the information of the ZAR array like uh, the data type, chunks, shape, name and everything. And Z address contains basically the custom attributes. Let's just say you want to add. Uh, so this, let's just take for example, this is a data set of uh, image of a 
tissue or cell taken from microscope name X. So you can add these information into Z adders. So this is what the V2 looks like, and so this is what and this is what V3 looks like. So in what V3, what we did is like we consolidated this Z array and Z adders into Zard.json, and there's like one small difference if you see here, like these uh, Z array and Z adders have dot in front of them. So basically, they were hidden. Like you can't see them unless you do like extensive search. Do like ls hyphen a. And Zard.json is actually visible in the directory list. And all these arrays are basically organized in multiple directories, like individual folders, based on like what the shape of the chunk is. So you can see the, uh, the V2 and the V3 comparison is like V3 is more uh, structured and more uh, consolidated as compared to V2. So this is what a single array looks like. And this is what the groups look like. So I think you, uh, you, you guys already saw this, and this is what the uh, V3 looks like. So in V3, there's a difference like every, so there's like a top level JSON which contains the attributes and the node name. And over here, like at the, at the bottom, when you see there are two individual arrays, this is similar to the JSON that we saw here. So basically like containing two individual ZAR arrays and having group them together into a hierarchy which is known as our groups. And you can organize like multiple arrays uh, in, a, in, the, in this manner and which could be like as deep as like one th like as deep as like 100 node levels or maybe more than that. So it's like a tree structure. Um, yeah, so we also added like the explicit support for features via extension mechanism. So I'm just gonna, you know, give an example of what it looks like. So these are basically the various uh, metadata fields inside the ZAR, uh, ZAR array. And these are like array, uh, array type, like how the chunk grids look like, what's the encoding, what are the codecs, and the storage transformers. So this is the actual metadata, what it looks like. So you can see like the data type over here is like float64. And the chunk grid is like regular, and encoding, and codecs. So all these various fields could be manipulated using extension mechanism, and basically, uh, for example, if you want to manipulate this data type field with extension points. So if you see like uh, over here, the data type is float64. And over here, we have defined a new data type, which is known as date time. And its configuration is unit in nanoseconds. So whenever you uh, propose a new change for the ZAR core specification via extension mechanism, the metadata will, field would change and all the associated properties with it. Um, so one of the most shining example of sh is extension mechanism in sharding codec. So sharding codec basically allows you to group multiple chunks into a shard, which is known as like, so every shard is known, is known as like a collection of multiple chunks. And so you might be thinking like, why, we want, why do we want to group multiple chunks in a shard? Like, why can't we just leave it there? Because uh, when you're dealing with uh, cloud storages, uh, the sometimes the chunk numbers go in the order of like 10 to power six or something like that. And when you want to do input output operations and you want to read this these number of chunks, it's gonna get like really hefty and the latency will be increase like many folds. So basically sharding allows you to read and write through these multiple chunks in a very efficient manner. And this, uh, I mean, it's similar to like what we saw in the ZAR dot, like the ZAR array. You have a ZAR dot JSON, which contains the uh, metadata file, and we have shards, which basically groups together the individual chunks into small, small packets. And every chunk is a compressible unit, uh, because as we saw, like ZAR basically compresses every each chunk, and every shard is a storage unit. And if you wanna read more about the proposal, like how it was uh, proposed and how it was accepted, um, you can uh, go to this QR, link, QR code. Um, moving forward, and yeah, so just example, like how would this look like in the sharding codex? So this was the general uh, metadata, and this was the codex. So basically, sharding was implemented via codex. And this codex was, so initially this codex was gzip, and this field would get modified once we enable sharding in our data set, and this would the sharding codex would look like. So basically, you expand this field into something like this, which which basically states everything, like the sharding index, the chunk shape, the codec, and the everything. And the, this is the CR, CRC32, CRC32C checksum, which basically validates the integrity of the individual shards. Um, yeah, and more extensions are basically coming soon, so uh, if you wanna have a look at, read at like what the extensions, what the current extensions are proposed, you can go to this link. And uh, the most, uh, 
exciting or the most uh, or the recent upcoming extension is the zeb3 which is known as the variable chunking so currently uh, the chunks are basically in a regular man like regular shape so as you've seen earlier the chunks are divided into equal shapes but variable chunking variable chunking will allow you to have like chunks of various sizes and this has like various applications in the field of like genomics and trans transcriptomics data yeah i always confuse with that name so yeah uh, it's still in process like the poc is ready and we are voting we are waiting for the voting phase when when the voting phase is passed then this will be actually included into the python implementation of zar um these are like couple of things that were renamed uh, if you compare zar uh, v2 metadata with v3 this d type is known renamed to data type chunks are replaced with chunk grid dimension separator is basically replaced with chunky encoding and the separator is uh change from dot to forward slash as uh, we saw in the uh uh okay yeah over here so the separator is basically changed with dot with so initially it was like 0.1 1.1 and now it's like foo slash c slash 0 slash 0 so that would be the address of the first chunk and if you have 0 slash 1 that would be address of the second chunk and so on and on mm okay um okay so this is so this was basically the brief of like what the v2 uh, specification look like v3 specification sorry v3 specification look like and now i want to focus like a few minutes on what the community is like and how we basically uh, reach this point where the v3 specification was accepted by the broader community of users uh, and yeah i mean i take care of community and i think like in my in my mind the community is the mix of the open source software and its specification users and developers the contributors and basically involves contributors and maintainers governance and council and you mix them all uh easy to use uh, it's like a good thing but a bad thing also and you get this something like so yeah so yeah so we have a large and diverse we have large and diverse active community but there's like this way that we are we want to like achieve the standards standard format so so zar is basically used across all the different scientific domains but ach achieving consensus is like a very hard thing like you need to basically go through various processes and that's why we needed a structured way to solicit and process the feedback because the discussion longs back to dates back to like 2019 and there was a lot of stuff which was i needed to like solicit and present it to everyone and this basically led to the creation of the zep process which was yeah written by me with the help of the others in the community and uh, yeah how we did it so it was mostly like reading lot lot of the existing processes and how they work which includes the pep and nep stands for numpy enhancement proposal and stack is uh, something which is used in the geospatial world uh i have previous experience of dealing with the uh, make basically making processes for the com community organization so that helped a lot and also understanding the needs of the community and which basically led to me like creation of the zip process and here's a blog post if you want to deep dive and if you end up making a process for your community or a project this blog post is really helpful like how i went through all the stages and how i made this um and how do you adopt zip it's simple like we have this uh, representation from every other software which are based on zar and everyone gets to vote like if this feature should be enabled if, if this feature should be added or not uh and you kind of like lay off so like fig speaking in a figure and the zip is adopted uh so just quickly going over the demo uh so this uh, has the uh link for the google collab notebook i have it here on my uh so i have a normal notebook and i can uh, just i will just go through over it so we uh, so basically zarita so currently the zarita which is the uh uh a derivative of zar has the poc implementation of zar v3 and it it is basically currently ported from zarita to zar and the main release is due somewhere around first week of june and you kind of like create a array in a normal way and you mention the store and you mention the shape of the shape of the uh, your big array and the chunk shape so basically your array will be 16 by 16 and your chunk shape will be 4 so it basically will let you have like four chunks in manner like when you divide 4 by 4 into four by 16 by 16 and you mention the codex which codex you want to use and if you want to add any attribute to it so this is what the array would look like and uh, the json would look like the metadata json would look like something like this and you can also open your array using the open function which is similar to like array dot open 
And if you're doing the, if you're opening a sharded array, uh, sorry, if you're creating a sharded array, you need to mention the shape of the chunk. Then you need to mention the shape of the big array, the name of the shape of the chunk, and also the shape chunk of the sharding codec. So this would basically result in having uh, four sharded, uh, four, sh four shards, which will have like uh, arrays of like two, two bytes of size. Um, and yeah, this is similar to like looking at the uh, arrays metadata is somewhere you'll see the, um, yeah, it's not neatly organized, but you can see the codex would somewhere mention, uh, yeah, okay, over here. The, the codec name is sharding index. So the fields would change when you change the configuration of your array and how you want to store the metadata. Uh, which is, and it is similar for creating a group. So every, so I basically stored a group into like multiple hierarchies. Like you can see there's like one array, two level down the hierarchy. And you can see like there's like group number one, group number two, and group number two actually contains the array. So there's like zar.json at the top and zar.json at the another node and zar.json, which is the actual zar.json for the uh, actual zar array. And if you want to navigate inside the group, the the top level uh, metadata would look something like this, which is like the ZAR format and the node type. The other metadata would, which is which is still uh, node metadata, which would look like the ZAR format three and node type group. But the third one, which actually contains the array, which looks something like this, which has all the information. And you basically open the group using like ZAR dot open group. Uh, okay, we're doing good on time, let's see. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, like it looks, it, uh, it sounds cool, but how does it look like? So uh, if you wanna see, uh, like, so basically, uh, if you scan this code, you're gonna go, to over th go over to this link, which is the, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is actually a V3 data set of a tissue of the uh, mouse's brain. And this was basically mentioned in a study by, I mean, you can cite this study, and this whole data set is basically in V3. And this is basically rendered in WebNOSIS. So WebNOSIS is a visualizer tool which lets you visualize our arrays in an interactive manner. You can interact with it, you can uh, make changes to it, you can annotate it and stuff. And there's also another visualizer which works really well because Web, uh, WebNOSIS has Im already implemented V3, so that's why it's able to support the V3 data sets. There's also another uh, visualizer by uh, Google, which is known as NeuroGlancer. It also has implementation of ZAR V3, so you can actually visualize your V3 datasets into NeuroGlancer. And it's gonna take some time to load it, but yeah, it, it'll look something like this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's, we are towards at the end, but uh, we have like, um, bi-weekly meet, community meetings, ZEP meetings, where we discuss the ZEP proposals, CODEF meetings and office hours. So if you wanna learn more about it, yeah, please visit it. And here's the link at the bottom. Um, and I think yeah, that's it. Thank you. Cool, thank you. I'm not seeing any questions on the slider, but maybe there's questions in the audience. Don't be shy. Oh, then maybe I'm in the, oh, because I'm not the admin. Okay, so I see. Why don't we, uh, while I figure that out, why don't you just ask your question? Sure. Yeah, thanks, very interesting talk. Probably a question you get a lot, but how does it compare to HDF5 in terms of reading speed? Yeah, um, so ZAR has a native support for cloud storage, uh, and I mean, I haven't used HDF5 that much, but in order to get the cloud enability in HDF5, you need to jump through like many hoops. And V3 is basically, V3 was basically uh, developed towards keeping the cloud storage in mind because all these domains which I mentioned earlier, like genomics and geospatial, they have like humongous, humongous data sets. So just for example, if I go to, uh, I have this, uh, I maintain this like small web page, which is r.dev slash data sets. And uh, come on. Um, and you can see there are data sets which are worth like one petabyte in size. And these are stored in a Google Cloud service. So it helps, like it actually helps and basically this uh, functionality which I mentioned sharding, which basically enables uh, like less latency input output operations when you're dealing with cloud storage. So I think that, that would be the most uh, highlight spotlight point that I would mention over HDF5. 
but HDR5 is great. Like, so, I mean, if you go towards the, uh, so <coughs> this is the actual documentation of ZAR and yeah, it's gonna take some time to load. So basically the design of ZAR was motivated by HDR5, so yeah. I, I, I'm not personally using ZAR, but I have colleagues using that uh, to uh, store satellite images in the uh, satellite images in the cloud. Um, but it's really massive amount of data. Like uh, there is really uh, sorry, on, it's, it's it's massive amount of data, like uh, almost terabyte of data. Mm -hmm. And I think I fear that there is quite stress of having to reprocess all the data to move to this new uh, version three. Hmm. Okay. So. Um, so basically, I was so I was in the meeting yesterday. We were we were discussing how would we lay out the path for converting the existing V2 to V3 datasets, and we are basically working towards a command line tool, which would help you to convert the datasets from V2 to V3. But but I suppose the scale of your datasets are in maybe thousand or gigabytes or something like that. So uh, I think we should talk about this, like how we're gonna get you towards the V3. Okay, I got it now, sorry. I had to log in as the admin. We have a couple more minutes. So um, these may have not been asked, of course. How do you manage the problem of the increase in size of the metadata? Was that already asked? Okay, so, so here's the question. So how to manage the problem of the increase in size of the metadata file when your data set is increasing over time? Hmm. Okay, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm gonna be honest, but I think this hasn't come up so far where the problem of increasing, the problem of uh, the large metadata, metadata has uh, occurred. So probably this is the edge case that we still need to uh, discover, but yeah, it's still uh, unexplored for now. I mean, usually the size of the metadata files are not that big, so um, if I can just uh, watch here, let's see over here, yeah. and. These are actually the array and things I showed you, and this is like what, uh, 498 bytes, like, and it's like JSON file. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a use, it's, it's edge, edge case, and we'll see like when we get to it. Cool, thank you. Uh, this may have already been asked, what does cloud native mean here? Cloud native means like your data, your format is, uh, can, it, can be, it can be stored easily on the cloud and retrieved easily. And you can make operations to it via uh, via using the pr uh, library itself and not using any proprietary or third party tool. Okay, this breaking change means that all existing data sets using V2 have been have to be converted to the V3 compatible format. Uh, not exactly. I mean, you can still uh, Zar Python will still support V2, uh, but there's a there's always an option for converting from V2 to V3. I mean, it's not gonna break your existing data sets. Thank you. Uh, how customizable is the compression of the files? Can you apply different compression techniques? Yeah, definitely, you can do that. And actually, you know, uh, we have uh, moved towards the, uh, oh, sorry, not this one. We have actually moved towards the uh, new uh, specification which allows you to lay out all the codecs. So currently we have listed these codecs, which are BLOSK, bytes, and CRC2. And you can also see sharding over here. So if there's any new codec you want to add to the current specification and you want to enable it for your use case, you can just create it over here and we'll be more than happy to assist you. So it's basically like giving the power to the community and letting you guys do the work for your use case. All right, we've got one more. Um, how is the relationship to OME czar? Will it also move to V3? Yes, so OME ZAR is actually a convention built on top of ZAR. So think of something like ZAR is the parent and OME ZAR is like a children, which is most, so OME ZAR, for the uninitiated in the audience, OME ZAR stands for Open Microscopy ZAR. And this is a format which is suitable for data sets which are coming out of microscopes. And uh, yeah, so OME ZAR is a convention of ZAR and the second part is, yeah, OME ZAR will be moving to V3, but that will be coming right after the uh, Zar Python moves to V3, which is somewhere around June. There's actually an issue somewhere. I mean, uh, if the question, if the person who asked the question, who can uh, just go on the you know Google and search Zar V3, OMI Zar V3 migration, they would see like a whole issue and all the discussion. Great, we're at time. Thank you so much. Let us thank our speaker.